Welcome to the Pillar Performance Podcast, the show where we connect with athletes and experts in their field across endurance sport. Today, we're connecting with Brett Robinson. We're going to learn how he transitioned from the 5K to the marathon, the nutrition strategies he uses in the lead up to these races, and in particular, his Australian world record. We're going to learn about how we overcome his stitch issues and the origin stories of pulse running and for the kudos, two companies that are shaking things up in the running industry. We also go into how he balances the priorities while also trying to be the best he can be at his running. Be sure to leave us any comments or feedback and we hope you guys enjoy. And I'm going to give a bit of an intro, Brett, before we throw it straight to you. So those of you who, who don't know, um, Brett, potentially those uh, outside of running and outside of Australia, uh, Brett is the current Australian Marathon record holder after a 207.31 at Fukuoka last year. Uh, he's a dual Olympian, uh, competed at Rio in the 5K and Tokyo in the marathon. Um, it was a pacer for the Ineos Sup two-hour challenge. Um, and he's also the, the, the co-founder of Pulse Running, a coaching group here in Australia, and also the For the Kudos Running podcast, which for those of you who haven't had a listen, I highly recommend. And um, it's probably going to be one that you're going to add to the subscribing list and one that I want to talk about a little bit later. Um, but Brett, hope you don't mind me saying you, you're definitely now an older statesman on the Australian running scene. And now having been in this space with Pillar and talking to some of these younger runners, you're definitely someone that we're hearing more and more of as has an unparalleled dedication. And I think is very clear that it's resonating and inspiring so many of these young and very, very talented up and coming Australian track and field athletes, which I'm keen to touch on with you. But mate, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Uh, thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it does feel weird um, being one of the older older people around on the scene now. Like I was just at World Cross on the weekend and they asked me to speak because I was the most senior person on the team. And I was like, geez, I remember, I feel like not that long ago, I was the youngest person on the team. So um, scary, but my body's still feeling good. So I feel young. Mate, awesome. And, and look, I think before before we dive in, I want to ask... I'll ask, okay, let's let's stay on the World Cross for 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 a moment there. I know you did a break, you, you did a rundown of it on on your own podcast this week. Um, and for those who want a more detailed um, breakdown of the of the race, which was a cracker in Bathurst here in Australia, go head over to the for the kudos. But talk to me, Brett. I know it's it's very rare, you know, it's it's Olympics and World Championships that you guys get to wear the Aussie colours and everyone's running for their countries. But you know, is there like like in you know in footy, you know, on a week to week basis, they do a bit of a jersey or a singlet presentation. You know, is there anything like that that happens in athletics? Like, as 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 the older states, but did they ask you to hand out the running singlets? Like, what is there any traditions um, that flow into our track and field team? Yeah, well, so we did um a bit of a bib presentation um the night before the race. Uh, yeah, nice. Actually, well, got, okay. Yeah, yeah, so we got Benita Willis to come in, who won World Cross, um, I think two thousand and four, and so she was handing the bibs out to everyone, and then she made a speech, and then I did a bit of a speech as well to everyone, but. Um, yeah, it, it is a bit like that. And I think it's special, especially for the juniors to kind of have that and have that connection with, with the older athletes. Yeah. Awesome. And I mean, there was, there's definitely a, a, an age gap in our team, but mate, we can talk about it a little bit later. What I do want to start with, um, and luckily this time you and I are both matching up on whoop. Um, we are, we are continuing on with our theme of sleep here and, and trying to help people, um, start to manage and optimize that better. You and I both are tracking this at the moment. What do your numbers look like from last night? You know. So it's pretty hot down here in Melbourne and I um, definitely had a bit of an interrupted sleep. So s sleep performance was 76%. Um, but yeah, kind of like when I go into it, you could tell I was uh, struggling a little bit with heat, just w waking up a fair few times. Um, so seven hours of sleep and kind of two hours of that was awake, which is uh, not, not ideal, but I could definitely, I think that's like one of the, with Woob, it's definitely one of the most uh, the best tools because I kind of wake up, I know I've had a bit of a bad sleep and look, it confirms it. And then I'm like, all right, I'm going to go for my run. I might just pull it back 10% today and just take it a little bit easier. Yeah. So you were, you were two hours awake. That is a lot. I mean, that's, yeah. I, I knew when I woke up, I knew as well, I had a bad sleep. You know, yeah. And if it's a hot night, exactly. You're yeah. It's pretty restless. I, 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 my, my, I was 50 minutes awake last night. Um, which has actually been a pretty regular occurrence for me. I probably should check to make sure my whip's still working. It seems to be 50 minutes often. Um, but I only had, I only have five hours and 10 hours, 10 minutes sleep, which is not great. I actually was traveling, I was on a very early flight to Melbourne. Um, so that's not great, but anyway, definitely not in the green, but I don't need to do what you do on a daily basis. So thanks for that, mate. Uh, uh it's been at least five uh, into it. So. I was going to say, like, it's been really good with, um, with especially around, around races where I kind of make a bit more of an effort to making sure I'm getting way in the green. Like, 
Um, I think the two days before World Cross, like I was like 90, 95% sleep. Um, and I, before I ran the, the marathon as well, like I was getting hit 100% sleep for a, f- a few days in a row. So I think like in training and like when you live a normal life, like it, it is a bit harder to, you kind of have to find that balance. But before a race, I would make sure like that's a priority. Yeah. And I think that's what one of the biggest learnings for so many people is yes, optimizing sleep is super important to actually live, perform, you know, be able to, you know, essentially optimize every element of your life. If you're not an elite athlete, is, is it like, you know, is it critical on a daily basis? No, no, it's not. You without a doubt can function, but it's really interesting as we talk to more athletes who really do dial into it to show how quickly it can actually be adjusted with one or two really simple steps mm. to be, you know, to be improved. And I think that's one of the best takeaways for people. It's like, Look at elite athletes as as an example of, hey, if you really wanted to optimize your sleep to get the best out of performance, either in your job or potentially, you know, for, for, an, for an elite, um, an elite amateur, um, you know, sporting pursuit as well. I think it's it's good, interesting to show for people that it can actually be done. It just, it, it, as you said, it requires to follow the data pretty heavily and make an actual focus on it. Yeah. Yeah. And But you can't get caught up with trying to do, achieve that every single day because it's just, it's just not possible. But if you're going, hey, I feel a bit, feeling a bit shit make a conscious effort and then you can easily turn things around mate one of the things i, I want to talk about and, and before we probably talk about the later stages of your career is is and it's an interesting one we can we can segue from here have you always been you know it's i, I know now having dealt with you you've you know you, you're incredibly dedicated you do um follow the numbers very heavily it comes with experience no doubt but coming through the ranks as, as a junior athlete like i know you obviously you you were playing a lot of soccer growing up um where did where did the love of running come into it and i suppose when you started how did that journey progress into, into what you're doing now um and to where you're at in your career and, and have you always been that way in terms of understanding you know the, the recovery side of and the optimizing side of, of what's required from you know to get the best out of yourself from a, from an athletic perspective um yeah so like obviously i grew up in canberra and and playing soccer as a kid and and that kind of made me just like this fit kid like I was always there when I could run around for ages on the soccer field and like they just kick the ball forward and I just run and get it and try to score a goal and um that kind of gave me that base fitness to start meeting like ACT cross country teams and the track team so um that's where I kind of got into running and then I quickly got a little bit of success and I think when you're at a young age getting success like it's obviously it's easy when you win it the love comes naturally um but yeah I've always been interested in kind of the training side um and just like learning about how people train and and yeah definitely recovery strength like i don't know i've always just i don't want to just do things like i want to know why i'm doing them and that's uh so i've always like kind of done my own research over things and like a lot of the time i'm like doing my own strength programs and stuff like that so i definitely understand i feel like i have a good understanding of training and and endurance training and how it works and so you started in when you when you first you know, made made that jump from you know essentially doing most sports as kids do, or when you're playing soccer. At what age did you let's 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 be honest? At what age did you stop playing soccer and you said no? No, I'm now going to run. Um, I think it was about 15 or 16. Um, I did it for maybe a couple of years. I was doing both, and then I thought, nah, like running's where I want to take it. It's what I want to try to do. Um, I don't know. I think I was lucky. I had kind of supportive parents where my like when I was a kid my goal was to be a professional soccer player a professional runner like and like I had parents that supported that and whatever I wanted to do so when I was 16 I was like all right now I'm going to be a runner like there was no I did, never thought all right I'm going to get a job I'm going to finish school get a job it was like I'm I'm being a professional runner that's what I'm doing oh that's awesome I mean and did you, were your parents were your parents runners and athletes uh they, they, they weren't runners like they sporty background I have nah, they, they played on the like, journey like because like, that's difficult right yeah definitely like um so like my dad plays golf and my mom plays hockey um they still both play but um no nah, like, like no one had been like a professional athlete in the family so it was just yeah i was lucky that they were supportive like i know a lot of parents aren't um and kind of i guess you can in running like you don't for a lot of the years you don't make much money so definitely a lot of parents were like all right it's time to give that up and, and get a proper job but yeah luckily i had parents that were just like no nah, if that's what you want to do you can do that so you finished finish high school in Canberra. You, did you run? Well, you, you know, did you start? I suppose you, you, as you said, you said you wanted, you knew at fifteen you were going to do professional. Well, the goal was to be either you know go down the the, the soccer path, um, or you were going to go down professional running. I mean, 
the AIS is, is, is in Canberra, but the, I suppose the decision to go to Melbourne, was that because that's, you know, you, you had the talent, that's where the best coaches were, you know, where, where, when did you link up and that, that journey, I suppose, now into the MTC and, and Nick um, kind of eventually from? Yeah, so I finished school and um, straight after school, I was going to World Juniors um, for the 1500. And so that was kind of like the first stepping stone into being a, I guess, professional runner, like I wasn't professional at all, but... I was I I got a job at a running store which could like give me a bit of money but I was had a world championships coming up so that's kind of like the first tick of the box kind of thing and um, went there ran well um, for another year or two was still like living in Canberra training with a good group of guys there um, and then in 2012 um, Ryan Gregson said to me he goes hey I'm moving to Ballarat to live with Carlos Birmingham. Um, we're starting a little group down there. Um, do you want to come down for a few weeks when I when I move in just to help him settle in? And I was like, yeah, sounds good. Like, can I do that little training camp? And then he said, if you like it, um, you can move move in with us. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to move down. Um, so I just made that decision straight away. I'm like, if I want to be a good runner, this is what I have to do. Um, I'm just going to go all in. Like, I didn't want to. I think yes, I was only probably like 20 at the time, but I'm like, I made that decision then. And I'm like, if I'm going to be the best runner I can be, I have to like make the right decisions and and not like look back i don't want to look get to 40 when i retire and be like oh what if i had done this differently i was like i'm doing what i think is right at that time so moved down joined mtc and um yeah it was like i quickly got success like i think i made the world champs the next year which was like a huge breakthrough for me at the time and at 20 you were still was was you know was were you training with ryan at the time or were you where was he training at the time how did you take made that uh, with him or did you was he training with Collis? No, nah, so he so he was in MTC, but he was living in Wollongong. I was living in Canberra, um, and but we were mates, so I used to like go up to his house, stay there for a few days, and like train on a weekend with him. Um, yeah, so I was just like, just because I was good mates of um, Ryan was why I got kind of invited to it. So it was kind of lucky. Yeah, that is helpful. And you and you moved down as a at that stage. Were you focusing on the five? What was yeah? Still, so. Still... Were you still doing class 10, 15, No, nah, I was kind of, uh, I'd only run like one 5K, I think. And I actually got a stress fracture in 2012 um, before I, I moved down. And then, yeah, but when I moved down, I'm like, all right, I'm definitely going to the longer distances. Like I knew 5K was kind of where it was going to be for me. And, and what the plan was then set in place towards, if you you know, if, if obviously you were injured 2012, when did you, I suppose, that, that plan get in place towards Rio? You knew that. 5k was going to be the target you know because we know olympic cycles you start to plan this stuff so far in advance did you know what you had to do in that four year period let's talk about the four you know first really probably fourth full year you know first olympic cycle of your your professional career did you set yourself you know what was your mindset going into knowing that rio was going to be your 5k were you even thinking and i'm really interested to know like how the progression happens with with, with running here like do you even then think another four years ahead and go, you know, then I'm, oh, you know, you knew obviously marathon is there, but were you, was that in the plan or is it really just cycle to cycle that it happens? Yeah. Um, so like, yeah, when I moved to, um, to Ballarat, it was definitely, all right, let's figure out what event I'm going to be good at. Um, we thought it'd be the 5k. If it wasn't going to be the 5k, maybe the steeplechase. And then, but I knew it wasn't going to be the 1500 or so it wasn't quite quick enough. So yeah, definitely was, let's, improved me as a runner i think that was like yeah we're in the olympic cycle and 2016 was the um kind of end goal but there was definitely stepping stones in that process because cut moving about right i was a 13 40 runner and he had to run under 13 20 to make the team so i was like i needed to improve a lot so kind of the yeah it was kind of let's see if i can become better at the 5k which i was able to do like around 13 26 um in may that year and in uh, 2013, and then a month later in 13-18, and qualified for the world champs. I was like, okay, so now it's now it's all about the um, 5K. So definitely started then thinking towards 2016. But uh, as you know, with, with um, athletes, injury kind of comes up every now and then. So 2014 was a was a bad year of um, injuries for me. But then once I was over them, the um, opening uh, qualifying period opened, and I was like, all right, now it's time to get into the Olympics and then and do it so started 2015 qualified for the olympics then that gave me a good 18 months to just focus on getting ready for the olympics and then post post rio the decision to go to marathoning how quickly does that how quickly does that come about 
for, for someone like yourself or yeah how did you, I, was it a quick process was it something that you knew about it before going into the olympics nah so i because i i know the way i am as a runner like i loved long runs i was good at threshold um i think it was ryan gregson had actually said it to me probably the first person that ever said it to me he said i reckon it would have been like 2013 or 2014 that one day i'll hold the australian marathon record and um and i was kind of like he was he knew it before i knew it like and i was like okay maybe i'm kind of be, going to be good at the marathon so i always knew i wanted to go to the marathon before it was too late i feel like a lot of athletes before me um went at the end of their career when their body was breaking down but i'm like no i want to go when i'm still like running my best and so yeah probably uh, i didn't think about it before 2016 but after 2016 i'm like all right now i want to run i want to see what the marathon's like um before 2020 so i can then decide what event i want to do so in 2018 decided to run my first marathon and if it kind of if i couldn't do them for a few years i would have went back to the 5k but then i started to get a bit of success and realized i could do it so um yeah but it is a long process like there is i know i I may not think about it but i know nick's thinking is in in the future about what event is is going to be right and a bit of a plan and can we talk a little bit and and essentially i imagine as a coach and i mean it sounds like ryan gregson is is a a damn insightful guy it sounds like he's going to be a brilliant coach um, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. You know, I definitely have played with players where I just sit there and look at them and go, you're going to make a brilliant coach. Um, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll he, he might fall into that boat. He might, he might fall into that boat as well. But like the, the, the decision when you go to marathon, well, I'm keen to know about the mindset behind what you have. Like, cause the marathon is, it's, it's a completely different beast as you know. And, and I'm, I'm really keen for you to talk to us through about how long did it take for you to actually learn learn what was going to be required to get the marathon right and and you know it's and, and potentially it's it's probably an ever 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 evolving process for people as you know it's going to be it's it's recovery it's tapering it's timing across the year on load nutrition um you know which is something mid-race you don't have to worry about as a 5k like talk talk to us about that how, how do you you know i'm sure you've got huge you know there's so many mentors across australia running and world running that have run the marathon that you t- you tapped into how do you go about that process of starting to learn how to do what is essentially a new sport? Yeah, it um, literally took me five years and I think I'm still learning. Um, yeah. I remember after London last year. Where do you start then? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I Well, after London last year, I, I ran a pretty good race and uh, Steve Monaghetti messaged me and I go, I think I'm starting to work out the marathon. And he said, message me when you work it out because I still don't know. Like it is just it is a tough event and it is a new sport. Like I coming from 5k going to the marathon, I wrote my first training block. Like I just thought I was so tired and I, all the time I'm like, I'm buggered. Like I was like struggling to get out of bed. And now I look back at what I do now compared to then. And I've like gone like 10 different levels and I train way harder. But I think that mindset at first of me, um, I think people get scared by it as well. Like I was going from running 160 Ks to 200 Ks and I'm thinking, yeah, this is so hard. I'm so tired. But, it wasn't necessarily that I was tired. I was I was scared of it, and I was thought I was supposed to be tired. So I'm telling myself I'm tired, um, where I probably wasn't really that tired, really. And um, but yeah, like I think every marathon, I think you just have to do them as well. Like maybe even um, for people that haven't run a marathon, just go and run one and see what it's about, see what the training's like. And I know people now sometimes do do a bit of marathon training just to see what it's like. Um, and then when you do then go and do one properly you're kind of more prepared for it it's um because yeah every single time i'm learning all right maybe if i do this it's a bit better and then you start now i'm like doing heaps more nutrition they're like i practice like uh like in the six weeks before a marathon like i'm practicing like four or five times a week with with in run nutrition where my first one i did it maybe like four times before the marathon like a few long runs i'll take a gel um so like things like that like you, you pick it up and it it does suck that like I wish it was just like a book and you could just read it and like, this is what you have to do. But you kind of have to go through each build and each thing to learn and then take it into the next one. Yeah, you almost, it's, it's the grand final strategy, right? You've got to lose one to win one. And it's like, yeah, it exactly. you almost got to, you got to do a man, you got to do a marathon, you got to do a marathon, run a, run a poor one to learn what's, what's not right. Does, as a mindset, do you notice that, like, is there a discernible difference between, because I mean, at MTC and your training group, like you, you've got runners that are, are varying distances. And as you've said now that, you know, there's five times a week or six times a week, you were saying that you are consciously focusing on what you're, what you're fueling with mid training. Do you take, you know, do you take a look back and maybe look at, you know, the shorter, the shorter distance guys and girls 
and you can just see that that's not a priority for them. And do you, you know, is there is there a is there is there a, is there a part of you that wishes like oh, I ask you. I wish I was still being able to do that and not worry about that kind of stuff. And, you know, or, or it's just come past and past. Well, like it's just, and I wonder, is it the other way around? Do they look at you and go, wow, look, look, look at how dialed in that Brent and the, the, the yeah. Mexicon, um team are because it'd be a unique. Yeah. I imagine it would be very unique for, the, for to mix the two within the one training session. Mm. And I think we can both learn from each other. Like, yeah. It is funny. I guess when I'm doing like refs of Stewie, and then I'm like trying to have these drinks between reps and stuff. And he's looking at me like, why is this guy taking a drink on? And I'm thinking, I wish I didn't have to do this because I'm just making myself feel sick. Just, but I'm just trying to practice. But, um, but hopefully, yeah, like what I do kind of rubs off on, on some of the guys. I like hopefully definitely guys like Jack who is kind of into the marathon and will be doing marathons. Like I can kind of lead that path for him and, and, and show him what it does take. Um, but yeah, yeah, it is an interesting dynamic between kind of the group because we've got, talented guys in, over every single distance but um i guess we work together as a group but we're also individuals and kind of respect what each person needs like i know even like we have rambo and stewie doing the same event but they're two different athletes and they both go about things different completely different but i think when you're at high level you just kind of have to respect what each person does um but then we come together as, as one as well and, and help each other so early on Early on, then, if we talk about that learning, particularly from the nutrition, you know, you know, you know, I'm, that's that's obviously for me something I'm very, very interested in. You got that opportunity and the exposure to the guys who've been doing it for a long time when you when you joined up with obviously Elliot's challenge to break two hours. And can you talk to us? You know, and there was so much, whether it call it marketing, call it exposure, whatever you want. Um, and I'm interested to ask you how much focus within that was there for not only you guys but also he himself around that nutrition because i mean you look at the documentary and it seems like that was without a doubt the most important fundamental um element of the entire thing but did you first first question was that a fact or is it just like no that was just you know pretty pretty well dramatized out of a good piece of content and then if it was did you actually you know did you take stuff away from that re understanding wow this is how dialed in i have to be to i suppose be able to hit, start to hit the times you know you could uh definitely um it's real i think how much um Kipchoge and his team take into fuel like it's like one of their number one priorities I reckon um I know they were like he would have a drink then they would weigh it to see how much he had taken so for the next one they knew how much to put in it so he could take even more or whatever it was but I think they are yeah we obviously with um they've spent years kind of perfecting that and trying to get the limits of how much he can take on as high as possible um and so I definitely, yeah, coming away from that, I'm like, all right, I need to start um, doing more and more with the, with the gut training and, and practicing taking off fuel. Um, but it still definitely took me a few years before I, I don't know, I kind of started seeing the benefits in myself. Like I would kind of do it and I'm like thinking I was doing it. And then now just recently when I've really been like doing it way more, I'm like, okay, I'm just like taking that to a new level. Like I, I can just take on a huge amount of fuel without it like upsetting my stomach where uh, I think in like say end of 2019 after Ineos, I was, I would do it in training and I'm like, yeah, I'm getting good at this, but I've been able to just go to way higher levels just from um, doing it even more. And then just even on easier ones, just because it teaches your stomach. It's interesting. I mean, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad to hear that it was actually, it was actually a case of not just, yeah. not just to over at worldshop.co. Man, I want to go a little bit deeper, if you don't mind, and I'm happy if, 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 it's, if it's trade secrets, but could you just go, in, go into detail? Because I think people are going to find this interesting, and me personally as well. 24 hours out from a marathon, like let's just take, let's say you're in Japan, and I mean, you've got to bring, I suppose, bring in contextual as well, where you are in the world at the time. Yeah. What did you, what did you eat? What were you eating? Give me the 24 hours out of Fukuoka when you did the 207. What was that? What, what, what did that 24 hours pre-race look like? Yeah, so my cover load the meals you were having. Yeah, my cover load starts um, 48 hours before, um, but both okay. my my two days before, my one day before is is pretty much uh, the exact same things. Um, I, like being in Japan, it, it can make it kind of hard as well. I, I kind of did some research during the week while I was there to find out what, what I can actually eat and, and what's good. I eat low fiber in those last two days, so I'm eating just like white rice, white bread, um, no veggies, um, sugary things like I usually take over like some bags of lollies and and things like that. Bit of soft drink, um, but yeah. So usually I would get up 
um, say 24 hours before for brekkie, I'm having maybe like four slices of toast um, and then probably some oats and stuff as well. Go for a run, come back. Um, I've been eating like the Morton solid bars, which are just like high carb bars. Um, and then also drinking like Morton as well, just to get me get in. Are you eating those? So 24 hours out, are you, and you said you go on that run post brekkie. So you're having four pieces of toast. You have four pieces of toast plus oats. You're having then, are you, are you having sugars on those? You know, you're loading that up with honey. Oh yeah. With honey, honey on it. Yeah, um, yeah, yep, yeah, Honey on it. Um, but yeah, and then I'll go from around, come back, have more carbs, like, yeah, which is usually like the Morton bar and some Morton drink, which is the same drink as I have in the race. Um, and then I think and it went out. So that's just your post runs. That's a post run snack then. That's what you would yeah. post run snack. And I'm, yeah. I'm by, by now I'm feeling pretty full as well. Like I've kind of done I'm maybe like 30 hours into my carbo load. So I'm pretty full of, of carbs and kind of sick of them. And so I'm just kind of, the liquid is a bit easier to get down at, at that point as well. Um, I think I then went out, maybe got a bit of sushi. Um, and that's probably like the only really meat or anything I ate um during that day and then i went yeah and then i was i was i think at the sushi as well i was getting like bowls of rice as well just to eat um and then yeah just through the day just kind of like snacking on like things like snakes and and some soft drink so r- real sugary stuff that, that's gonna just kind of go in my body easily um and then for dinner i just went out i had like two uh, big bowls of like plain udon and um and then like a couple of big bowls of rice so yeah, it's just like um, there's definitely a lot more like snacks in there as well. But um, I, I'm I'm aiming aiming for about like twelve um, grams of carbs per kilo, um, which I think is like pretty high for for most people. So um, yeah, there's a lot of food. And so re- and within that within that twenty four hour period, you're you you're snacking. You said you're having you know you're having something pretty pretty easily pretty easily measured which is obviously you're, you're saying you're having the morning bar then you're having a you're having another drink post run with carbs you know i suppose you're, mon- you're probably not monitoring exactly how many lawyers you're having in terms of that but did you do you do any blood glucose monitoring do you do you go that deep into it it's not something that you do you like to follow that down to do a science or i haven't i like i have i did um do a study um uh well, like last year i think and i, I wore one of those um the, like the constant measures on my arm and kind of just saw what my um my bloods were doing but like nothing really like showed up like that i go low or I go too high so i don't measure it outside of that like everything's just kind of in normal range but um i i have like a a rough plan carbo load plan that i use um but obviously it has to be flexible because when you're traveling like you just have to be um what whatever is available is what you have to eat really and what about fluids? So you said you're obviously having more carbs within fluid post run. How much? I mean, how much fluid are you having after that? After that morning drink, you're having morning. Like, what are you having? You know, then you said lunch was another. You know, sushi plus a heap of like that. You're talking a heap of rice right now. Like, yeah. How are you washing? How are you washing that stuff? How are you, how are you washing it down? Yeah, like I'm definitely drinking um, water. Like I would have maybe a little bit of um, electrolytes, kind of some salty. Um, yeah. drinks or like like salty tablets but um i'm not i don't go like over the top on um on hydration like i feel like i'm someone who's always like i always have a drink bottle with me i'm always like sipping on water but i'm not not like constantly trying to like drink too much like i think that was a mistake i used to make is it um when i was a bit younger like i'm like oh, i need to get as much water down as possible and i'm just probably just flushing my whole body out but so now i'm just like I'm, i know i'm getting a fair bit through dr- having a couple of mortons during the day and and then just sip it on water throughout the day. And then when you, if we, if we then take it, the very the morning, the morning of the morning of the run, um, wait, wake up. What, what what time are you waking up there? Then you're trying to get that that night before. You're trying to get as many hours of sleep as you know. You're going to bed at a, you know, incredibly early hour, or you're really just too you yeah. excited to sleep. Or and before that Tokyo attempt, how how was your sleep that night before? Um. So the the good thing about going to Japan is the two hour time difference where. If I'm going to bed there at um, ten o'clock, it's it's uh, twelve o'clock here, so you fall straight to sleep. So I was definitely getting good sleep there, and I yeah, kind of the the race area starts at midday, so it's it's not an early start. I reckon I got up at like seven thirty, um, so that's like sleeping until nine thirty here, 
weird so i've definitely had it was well rested when i woke up um went down and brekkie had again a couple of bowls of rice like i was filled to the brim with rice at, for that race but um then i would have been sipping on a, a morton as well um a couple of pieces of toast and uh yeah coffee and then and so i timed that to have that three hours before um my race and then and that's and then i had a um morton bar probably about 90 minutes before my race and, and that's all i ate in the morning and so you yeah you, you, i do you do see you see the you know the carb load on i suppose um not not the elite level of marathoning and it's it, there's I would say there's a lot more flavor involved in the carbon yeah. for some people. I mean, you, you, you've literally extracted any fun out of that 48 hour period, but do you find, is that because in the past you may have had rice with, or you've had pasta with sauce on it? You've had, did you just, did, does that just kind of sit well with you or you were just, you're just really, is that something yeah. adjusted over time to have a, a, a huge amount of rice, but B to just extract any form of, you know, any other micronutrient as well. You just want that pure carb. And to be able to yeah. measure it to make sure that's what's going in. Yeah, pretty much. Like at the um, when I started having these stomach issues um, or like stitch issues, I like spoke to my dietitian and and she just recommended taking everything out that could potentially upset my stomach. Um, so yeah, no all sauces, all that. It's all it's all gone. So it's pretty much just plain rice is what is what I eat mostly um, in in those days. So. Um, like I know, I know now I can definitely could take on a bit more because I don't think that it's actually my stomach that has anything to do with my stitch. Um, but I, I just think, I feel like that works for me. I like it's. I feel like I can just get heaps of rice down, and yeah. But it's it is just the safest way for me. And in regards to the stitch, can we dive? Like you said, you know, you now know it's not your stomach. That is, yeah. I mean, how, when you you obviously had, had that as an issue. Um, if you know, if that was sort of kind of a focus for you, how did you like talk to me about how that came about? Was it, was this, was stitch, you know, stitches are obviously something that so many runners dread. Was it happening at the same time? You know, and, and it's, I imagine it's very similar to a cramp, but, yeah. um, how, how do you break down what, what is actually the physiological, I suppose, cause of it? How did you, how did you go through that? Yeah. Well, it's, it's been the most frustrating thing of my life. Just been, uh, years and years of like kind of disappointment and and doing all these things and thinking i'm on top of it um like i had cortisone injections before races i had um seeing specialists and everyone wait, like getting wait, all these wait, things just, where do you cortisone a stitch I'm um that, so there was thinking it was like a rib joint irritation so i'd get a in in my really? ribs yeah um so it's really really hot, really, really hot off. yeah yeah so where i get it it's like kind of like my top ab like just below my ribs so which I guess is also where your diaphragm is as well. Um, but the, I just got, the way I run, I, I move a little bit to the right and they were thinking maybe my rib, my ribs are just getting irritated, a bit of like a slipping rib syndrome. And uh, so they would just inject it. Hopefully that would master pain um, and it didn't. So, which was annoying. Like, he, cause I go into a racing and oh, I'm, I'm on one here. I've got it, I'm feeling good and gets 25K. I'm like, ah oh, shit, here we go. Here comes the stitch again. So it's, and it was just very frustrating, like, especially like the one, like the Olympics, like I hate going, running for your country and, and you're having to jog just because you're in pain and like, you know, you don't feel that tired, but you just, you can't do anything because as soon as you go harder, you're just in so much pain that you have to go back to a jog anyway. Um, so that was very frustrating. And then in London last year, I was just running and I had been doing so much mobility. Like I thought I was on top of it again. Then the stitch came and then. I just, this just thought came into my head about this coach I had when I was like 14 said, if you ever get like a stomach stitch, just do this thing with your breathing where you kind of breathe in twice and then breathe out. And I was like, all right, just started doing it. And then I was like, hang on a sec. I think my stitch has gone away a little bit. And I was like, all right. And then I remember this other thing of where a coach told me to breathe out on my left foot strike if I'm getting on my right. So I'm like, all right, I'll start doing that as well. And it kept going down more. And I was like, okay, I think I'm onto this. So I would kind of like get it down and then it would come back a bit, get it down. I'm like, okay, I've definitely figured something out here. Like, this is good. Um, I ran a good time then, but then going into Fukuoka, I'm just like, all right. I, I just kind of accepted the fact I'm going to get the stitch at some point. But when I do, as soon as I get up, this is what I'm going to do. And so same thing, Fukuoka got to bury 24, 25K, 
here comes the stitch. So I just start doing it straight away and just went, went straight away, went, went away. And then um, a few K later, it would come you back. Did, so I'd just do it again. Double, you did, did the double breathing or the breathe on the left? Both, side? both. So double breathing. Okay. And then, yeah, as I'm breathing out, I breathe out really hard and stamp my left foot pretty much. Um, and yeah, just kind of took it away. And every, every few K would come back. I'll just do it again, take it away. Um, so that's why I could just push all the way to the finish where there'd be no other marathon where I've been able to do that. And talk to me, do you now share, I mean, you, 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 with, with, with what you guys are doing with pulse, you, you have an opportunity to mentor and coach, um, all the way through to, you know, people's multiple marathons, but you know, some first timers as well. And I imagine you get asked this, you know, you know, what do I, what do I eat? What happens if I get a stitch? What, you know, what happens if my shoelace comes undone? You know, is it a unique now experience for you as this is built and, you know, you are without a doubt now the authoritative voice, let's just be honest, in in, in, in Australian marathon right now and you would be that that point of call for so many people. What kind of, like, what what advice do you give to people, you know, when you, when they're trying to learn what their carb load day looks like? Mm. Where, do you tell, where do you tell them to start um, considering what you learn along the way? Yeah, well, I guess that's um, kind of what Pulse wanted to be like we're kind of like we've made all these mistakes over our career and and we've been through all the hard things we can take what we know and hopefully give it to you um and so yeah definitely like with a lot of our marathon guys i kind of show them this is an example of what i do um change like this is why i think it works and change it for foods you like maybe but these are things you should probably avoid um stitch is a great one because now i feel like i'm an expert on it i don't I don't know how to prevent it, but I know how to get rid of it. Um, and it's funny, like I get people from all around the world messaging me and be like, hey, I heard you had a stitch. I heard you got rid of it. What did you do? And so now I can tell them, which is good because there was like a, a big, like, I don't know, because I was messaging people as well that it, I'd heard it had it as well and be like, what are you doing? And uh, so hopefully now we're kind of solving all that. But yeah, it is a thing about Pulse where hopefully we've been there and we can kind of give that um, that information back to people. Is there is the um, I'm interested to know is the marathon is the is the is the top level of marathoning is it is it a sharing you know is it a gig economy do you, you do you guys do you guys share a bit of info like how how high up the tree could you could you potentially send a text message out to someone who might give you some honest feedback yeah I don't know or is it just yeah I mean so those but how how close are all you guys you see each other yeah like de- definitely and I think with the marathon as well the marathon takes care of itself like. It, you, you can be rivals with people, but there's you, you, it's you on the race day who, like, you have to get through the marathon yeah, yeah, first yeah, before yeah. you can try to beat these people. Like, you got to beat yourself before you can beat them. So it's, um, yep. you, you can't get too caught up with, like, worrying about other people and, until the last couple of K of the race, then you can battle it out. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I'm, I think I'm lucky, like, just kind of being with Nike and with, um, kind of doing Ineos and stuff as well. Like, I do know, um, coaches and managers and, and athletes that are, are some of the best in the world so um I, I yeah i know with when i have this stitch like and, and like nick would reach out to people as well and like we're getting some of the best best most experienced people in the world telling me what to do and um yeah which is uh definitely handy have you have you have you asked for feedback cross sport at all i'm interested to know no, nah, so I, one thing I was um, interested in doing was um, seeing a breathing specialist. I think we were trying to organize it that um, I know like some of the big wave surfers see, see these people that do stuff with breathing and I, because obviously it has something to do with my breathing or, or my diaphragm or something. So that is, um, yeah, I'm definitely keen on, on, on speaking to other sports and, and seeing what they could do. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, we've got it, we've got it, we've got a pretty cracking big way. I mean, Clint Kimmons. Yeah, yeah, I know him. I know Clint. Oh, yeah. triathletes as well. But yeah, I mean, that's he's an interesting one. Would be have a really interesting take. Like, I mean, I imagine done a huge amount of breathing work, and then also, you know, doing doing Ironman um, triathlon as well. Um, I imagine has he has he given you advice on that breathing? No, he hasn't. So I don't. I uh, yeah, he's definitely one I should I should reach out to. <laughs> <You> bastard. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is funny. Like, um, like I know after I got the stitch, and then I was like talking to someone, and they're like. I told him I do that breathing, and they're like, "Yeah, yeah, I've known that for years." And I'm like, "I've been struggling with this stitch for ten years. Like, why haven't you told me this?" And I just, I don't know, people would just kind of forget about it and think about themselves a little bit. I'm like, "I wish I knew this five years ago." <laughs> <laughs> and mate, so are you? I'll stay on the stitch for one more question before we wrap up. We both got to shoot, but your 
I know, I know you, you, you've you worked with a running coach, Paul McKinnon. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, that's, that's the balanced runner on Instagram as a handle. Um, talk to me about how biomechanically you guys looked at the stitch because that's yeah that would be quite unique for some people to actually consider what you guys worked through mechanically with your technique. At, yeah. at, you know how, how and then you said I heard you say before you lean you said you lean to the your drop the right yeah I, I swing a bit to the right um so that, that's what we kind of worked on like I I kind of uh, he would like say that I kind of like run proud so I like pull my, put my chest up and then then I swing to the right as well so if you think about like your, your bottom ribs there like when you're doing that that's just stretching that your bottom ribs the whole time so he was kind of getting me a bit more compact like leaning forward a little bit more, getting my arm swing just a little bit more tighter and just kind of keeping that kind of torso just running forward instead of swinging to the right, um, which I, I think definitely helped. And I, and I know it's like what it's the main thing I think about when I'm when I'm running as well. Like when I'm kind of getting in a rhythm in a marathon, like I just kind of think about his cues, get into that position and just try to do that as, as best as possible. So it's... um. Uh, I think it even just takes my mind off the pain a bit as well. I just focus on that job instead of kind of being hurt or or um or what pace I'm running and stuff like that. Which so I think it really helps and um definitely yeah helps with just kind of hopefully keeping me less injured as well. Yeah, it's an interesting. It's an interesting one. I think there's a lot of people who can learn. You know, it starts to look at you know you look at try and look at a cause of a problem and and take it you know peel it back layer by layer. And as you said, sometimes the simplest stands is right in front of you. But I'm, yeah. I'm keen to wrap up um, Bradley, with one question um, that I'm, I'm hoping or maybe just some insight is to you. And I know you're not one and you're very well known not to be kind of one that to go out and openly celebrate, uh, you know, the performances over the years and then particularly not some of the races you do locally. Um, you're a very, very reserved guy, um, which is why I imagine, yeah, you, you're very popular on the Aussie team. But in terms of how you balance things, you know, now as an old, as an older runner, you've, you've, you you have seen you have seen two Olympics. You've been in the stadium and then out on the road. Um, you've you've you're working, you know, as as a coach. You've now launched um, for the kudos, which is which is growing, um, you know, essentially every every single episode. How do you do? You feel that balance and that mindset now, and you know, with your experience, was that always something that you were going to be fine? Really, you know, it seems to me from the outside. You have the you know you have the ability to compartmentalize every process you know throughout throughout your your um, I suppose throughout the week um, you can you know when when it's time to switch on for running you know and have as you've said have all these disciplines not just the training but all those disciplines involved in marathoning then to have that balance and to launch something like for the kudos which from the outside mate looks like you guys are a having a hell of a time doing but also b uh, being very professional about the way you're going about it and, and actually giving some people sites there is that something that you knew you were going to do later in the career or something that just naturally evolved uh yeah well the podcast that was just a natural thing like i didn't, I didn't ever really think about doing that and then i just happened to be living with joel and and um he just kind of said it to me one day oh we should do a podcast and i was like oh yeah yeah and then came back the next day he's like i think we should do the podcast and then i was like all right let's just do it um that just kind of happened and it happened quickly but i think it's kind of gives me a good little balance like i I've always been able to, um, whatever's gone on in my life, I can always just, it would, I would never let it affect my running. Uh, and I think that's the same with, like if I'm busy with the podcast, busy with coaching, it's just like running comes first and, and I can, if I'm stressed out about someone else, I just can just switch that off and just focus on my running. Like yeah, I think it means so much to me that nothing, I'll, I won't let anything affect that. Um, but I think having these kind of few other things going on in my life, it kind of makes me a bit more structured. Like I get up, I'm like, I do my running to the best of the ability I can. And then I move on to my coaching. I do that, move on to the podcast. And it's just kind of, I don't know, it just separates a few things that just have a, I guess, a bit more purpose to my day than just kind of running and, and not doing much else. Um, and at the, it's not like the stressful jobs either. So I still feel like they're good for recovery and it just kind of keeps my mind active instead of just lounging around all day watching Netflix. And man, I was the same. And now the back end of my career, I was doing, you know, 101 different things between training. And I mean, I'd get younger guys come out and go, mate, don't you get tired? And, and as you've said, as long as, as long as you're clever about those external things that you're doing and they're not physically draining you, mm. the fact of not, I always found the fact of sitting around doing nothing. I found that the hardest thing to get up for in, you know, so I had a, we had a later afternoon session and, you know, I know you do, you know, you do double days and, I actually found if I was able to occupy myself mentally throughout the day, like I actually have more energy going in yeah. to the afternoon and doing that kind of stuff as well. And then also, 
it actually benefited my sleep at the end of the day because I was like, shit, now I'm actually cognitively tired as well. Can yeah. sleep well because I know those guys that it was often the guys that were sitting there not really doing and occupying themselves, just training, that then would also be night owls. And purely not because they wanted to be, just because they just weren't, you know, they weren't challenged enough mentally. You know, as, as you know, but once you've been doing what you've been doing for 12 years, like Monday to Friday, it just it just rolls over, right? The body mm-hmm. takes you where it needs to go. Um, and mentally, it's not like you don't have to look at the schedule and training and you're like, you know, you don't get anxiety about those sessions or maybe you still do, but I'm sure it's much less than it was. Um, and so that's yeah. the thing, like I think, you know, for athletes, I feel like- you could learn from yourself that are doing yeah, I feel like I, um, like a few years ago, like I would just, when I was just running, doing nothing else and like, yeah, I'd stay up all night and just not really have, have much to go on. And then I just kind of get up, go for my run and just kind of just do it half ass a little bit away. Now I feel like, like I get up pretty much, like I, I wake up in the morning, I'm kind of like keen to get going and, and keen to get ready for my run and do it. And, um, and I feel like I'm achieving things every day. It's not, not just running, but like outside of running, but. I definitely feel like I approach my running differently as well because I'm like, all right, let's just put 100% into it right now and then move on to the next thing. So I don't know. I, de- I definitely think it's a good thing. It's it's a nice little balance I got. Yeah, mate. Awesome takeaways. And I think for anyone listening, guys, um, yeah, it's probably a thing that I would I would totally agree on as well. And I'm sure Brett would, you know, make sure if you are going down the professional, you know, the professional, you know, avenue of sport, doesn't matter what it is. Like I really do think that balance is everything. Mate, Brett, I know you got to bounce. Thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, I know you're often interviewing other people now on the podcast. So that's a good change. Good change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've been wanting to get you on for a long time, mate. Um, what you've been doing now and what you continue to do um, is, is is super impressive. Um, I can't wait to watch your journey to the next Olympics. Um, but thanks so much for coming on. No, thank you for having me. 